Uh... Hi, Scott. Hi. Question for you. Okay. Did dinosaurs actually exist? Why aren't they in the Bible? Uh, yes. Dinosaurs did exist. And why aren't they in the Bible? Well, there's plenty of things that are not in the Bible. Like, my brain isn't mentioned in the Bible, but I'm talking to you here and now, which would indicate evidence of a brain. And so we have evidence of dinosaurs, such as fossils and other materials that would suggest that they actually lived and roamed the earth and had a great, fantastic old time. Now, some might challenge the fact that I have a brain, but I can assure you that every now and then there's glimpses of it being there, just like there are glimpses of dinosaurs being real. And in fact, actually, I have been to Washington, D.C., where there is the T-Rex bones, and I have felt them and can attest that there is a dinosaur just like there is a brain in my head, neither of which are mentioned in the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, your students and kids are in great hands with our family pastor, Scott, Cody. Before I deal with that, though, I, I want to do one thing. Um, every year, at the end of the year, last quarter, we have the opportunity to go to you and say, hey, here's how we're finishing the year. And like most organizations, we get somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of our giving at the very last minute. And this is John Batarsi, our executive pastor, who makes everything happen around here, which is awesome. John, uh, yeah, you can give it up for John. He has a hard job keeping me in line, too. John, I want you to just tell us, how did we finish up? Yeah, so at the end of October, we shared with the church that we had $2.8 million to go in order to meet our anticipated ministry and mission expenses for the year. So we needed to receive $2.8 million to finish the year strong, and we're excited to share with you that the preliminary reports are showing us that we finished the year with nearly a quarter million dollar surplus, which is just phenomenal. Unbelievable. That is, that is praise to God for how he's word. That is praise and gratefulness to you for the fact that you choose to say, God, I trust that you taking my money and doing more with it as I invest in your kingdom is greater than what I could do for myself. And that's your faith in him and in this church. And so I'm grateful. But were there any things that you saw in that kind of last month that you wanted to share with us that were surprising or, or interesting to you? Yeah, so two things stood out to me uh, from this past year. One was for the month of December compared to the previous year's December, we saw a 61% increase in what was given to the church, which is just phenomenal. Uh, and, and the second thing that is just incredible is where uh, those funds came from, who gave, and we saw nearly 100 new families participating in giving to, uh, to our church here at St. Andrews. That's amazing. Uh, thank you. Give it up for John and for all that he does here. Grateful for you and your steady hand. And again, we just praise God for what he's up to in this church. Um, okay, so here we are. It's the beginning of the year. I want to say hi to a few groups. One, those of you watching online. And also, our student ministry is in the room with us uh, for this series. We're super excited to have you here. And, and here's why. Because uh, we're starting this brand new series called Asking for a Friend. And what we're doing is, uh, as a pastor, I and Pastor Manny and Shannon and others, we get asked questions all the time when people get into the office and they sit down. Oftentimes, they'll kind of close the door and lower the volume of their voice, and they'll ask a, a question that's just been burning for them. And some of those questions are just incredibly deep and, and really important, and some of them are just wild that they want to ask that question when they have a pastor in their hands. But we picked about eight of those, and if you remember, at Christmas Eve, we said, hey, what questions are you and your friends asking that you want us to deal with? And so you voted, like 600 people voted for these six things we're going to look at the next few weeks. And I am so glad that you chose really easy, simple topics like how can science and faith get along? How do they coexist? That's what we're going to talk about today. Have you ever been asked something about that? Like how can you reconcile your faith in God isn't that a myth? How do you reconcile that with like good hard science? Has that ever been asked of you before? Or somebody ever said to you like, uh, you got to choose. It's either the Bible or the textbook in my class. Some of you who have already gone off to college, those of you who are about to head there, you may get faced with that. This idea that you can't believe both. You got to check your brain at the door if you want to be a person of faith. That it's either intellectualism or it's spirituality but not both. 
And what I want to tell you for the next few minutes is that not only is it my contention that you don't have to do that, but I actually believe that you shouldn't. That in fact, our world, the created order and the God behind it, is one of an invitation to learn and see more and more of who he is and what he's about through science than to throw it away. Uh, this question has been asked for a long time. This is the cover of a Stanford Medical Magazine from a few years ago. And, and that kind of puts it right. It's either the beaker or the Bible. And there's a divide between and the two can never work together. And yet, I believe that the scriptures, the Bible in our Christian faith has been telling us for thousands of years before modern science even came along that that is not a decision you have to make. In Psalm 19, the writer says this at the very opening. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world in the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. How many of you have noticed the, uh, the sunsets recently? Anybody been paying attention to that? Unbelievable. Like just add it to the list of reasons that I'm so glad I live in Southern California now. Uh, I snapped this picture um, just a, a week or so ago. And I, I found myself just staring at that ocean and that sunset, and thinking about that verse, that the heavens are screaming out, declaring something about this God, who he is, and what he's like, what he's up to in the world. And and if you'll go with me for just a moment, I want to tell you a little story. Um, You can get inside my weird brain for a second, because I was standing on the, the ocean, like on the beach, watching the tides come in and out, you know, just waves crashing, thinking about all of this message. And I was thinking about how I'm standing on this sand, and sand has a a chemical composition such that it doesn't dissolve in the water so that it can be separate. Unlike if you're standing on, you know, silt or dirt that turns into mud and dissolves. I'm able to stand here and watch this water move. And the water is moving with tides that something like 30 feet in, in movement, in difference. Because the, the moon that has this gravitational pull is pulling them. And, and it's pulling them on the side closest to the moon. It, it pulls them up and that's high tide. But, but here's what one of our high school students last night corrected me on. Thank you, Silas. I love our high school students. It's not just on the side closest to the moon, but the tides on the other side of the earth called low high tide are also being pulled up as well. And so I'm watching as I stand on the sand this sunset and the sky and the water move toward me. And I'm, I'm thinking about this fact that my body is made up of like 60% water. And, and then some muscle and bone and fat. The composition is not your concern right now because it's January and we're all doing better, okay? <laughs> but but I'm, I'm standing there and, and there's this electrical current that's running through my body. And that current is passing through about 45 miles of nerves if you stretch them out end to end. And as the ocean's lapping up over my feet and the electrical currents are running through, there's blood pumping. And if you stretched out the blood vessels, it's 60,000 miles of blood vessel. That's all just happening as I'm looking at this sunset. The, the psalmist said, the heavens have declared the glory of God. And it's not just that, because I'm still, I'm like steady in my spot. But you know, the earth is moving around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. I don't care if you like NASCAR or not, that's fast. And it's not just moving around, it's also spinning like this at a thousand miles an hour. So my body with all of its water and electrical currents and blood vessels watching this is spinning around and because uh, there's this force called gravity that's holding me there, I'm not flying off because of centrifugal force, right? Because I'm moving at the same rate. And I'm able to look at that sunset and think about it. And then I'm on just one planet in this one galaxy we know of called the Milky Way. And there are a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. A hundred billion stars. And the best estimates are that there's actually at least a hundred billion galaxies 
in the universe. The hundred billion stars. And at the same time, the universe has this incredible amount of what scientists would call fine-tuning. Such that in our universe that is expanding, accelerating away from us as fast as it began, and it's speeding up, that in that universe, it is a perfect balance of electrical charge, same number of protons as there are electrons. And if there was only 10 to the negative 40th power difference, that's a really small number, 10 to the negative 40th power difference in that, it would cause either clumps of matter to implode together or to fly apart. Life couldn't exist. There's this cosmic fine-tuning, and then there's Earth's fine-tuning or local fine-tuning. The fact that the mixture of the air that we breathe and that there's enough water in the crust of the earth and all of the physical properties of where I'm standing watching this ocean and looking at this sunset that make life possible. And then I have in the back of my mind this question. Can science and faith really work together? Because the only way that I know any of those things that I just told you is because of science. There was this one guy, a scientist, some of you will remember him, his name was Carl Sagan, and the Voyager, uh, this spaceship was going out, and it, it turned around and it took what they called a cosmic neighborhood photo, and it looked back at Earth before it hit interstellar space, and, and in that sunbeam, that ray, you see that dot, that's us, that's Earth. Uh, there's a recent Webb telescope took this same picture from underneath the rings of Saturn, and that bright spot is, is our Earth. Well, when Carl Sagan, this scientist, looked at that, and some of you will remember his show, Cosmos, or his book, uh, he had this to say about it. He said, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of Confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Carl Sagan and others look at that and they go, look how small, insignificant, tiny, and pointless we are. But you can also look at that same pale blue dot and you can say, look at how small, insignificant, and purposed we are. What is man that you're mindful of him? What do I need to learn about the God who would want to be not just present, but close in a relationship with me? One moment existing on that pale blue dot. Science allows us to find the answers to how this world works and what God created and the order with which he gave it, but only faith allows us to answer a different set of questions, a set of questions about purpose and meaning. And in fact, that's one of the places we get in trouble. So before I go any further, important caveat, I'm going to talk to you from the Bible a little bit, and I'm going to give you a little bit of science, and I'm going to give you some resources later for you to study on your own, because uh, can we just get out of the way? I'm not a scientist. So, like, guarantee there are things that aren't going to be exactly precise. Uh, but I don't have to be perfect in that because both, I believe, my Bible and science can give us answers. But the problem is when you approach it, looking at the Bible like a textbook. It's not. In fact, here's the first thing you got to know. The Bible is an ancient text. And I know many of you are like, I hope you didn't study a lot of hours this week to come to that conclusion. But, but I think we kind of forget that, and we begin to look at the Bible and ask questions of it like it's a modern Western text. See, the Bible is answering a different set of questions than science. The Bible is asking not how and when, but who and why. 
That whenever we study or we engage God through faith, that we're trying to find out more of what he's been doing behind the scenes. But if you come to it as if you're trying to get the specific scientific answer, it's not what it was designed to do. It's got a different purpose. And so there's this verse that I find so intriguing. It's in Proverbs 25, verse 2. And it kind of gives me a hint at to what we, could, what we could do here with science and faith together. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. To, to be so omnipotent and so other and out there that he can create something that we can't understand with our finite brains fully. But he says, to search out a matter is the glory of kings. Here, here's what I think he's saying. That while God is so far above, he has built into this universe an invitation to discovery. There's a theologian and scientist named Jay Richards and Guillermo Gonzalez who wrote a book about this very idea uh, that you might want to pick up and look at. It's called The Privileged Planet, How Our Universe, Our Cosmos, is Designed for this discovery. And it reminds me of like a really simple illustration. Like when you're trying to teach a kid to walk, you know, when they finally they show like they've got the motor skills and the ability to do it, the way that you help them walk and discover bipedal motion is not by taking their legs and picking them up for them one at a time, moving them forward, right? What do you do? You place an object that they want in front of them, a toy, a cookie, their mother, whatever. And you watch them teeter, totter, and wobble forward on those legs. It is the glory of us to learn and to discover. And I think that's what actually science can do. So I'm going to tell you over the next few minutes that I believe the pursuit of science, this tool that's used to help us understand, is actually for the glory of God. Because science and faith, they're not competitive. They're actually complementary. Science is a tool that helps us grasp the natural. And faith is the way that we begin to understand the spiritual and the supernatural. And I think the most fulfilled humans spend time doing both. But what's interesting to me is that Christianity is actually the framework that made this whole thing possible. You could argue with me, but here we go. There's a, a couple of writers, Charles Thaxton and Nancy Piercy wrote this book called The Soul of Science. Uh, and they talk about this idea. See, in the ancient world, there was no such thing as an atheist. You know this, like, atheism is a particularly modern uh, opportunity or option. But before, everything that happened was attributed to a God or to Yahweh God, the God of the Christian Bible. And, and everyone believed that, but something took place that caused people to begin to see deeper and longer and, and smaller. Some technology change that in the course of human culture allowed them to begin to explore at a depth that they hadn't before to create theories and postulates and laws. And all this happened in a particular place. Here's what Piercy and Thaxton say. It was Christianized Europe and not more advanced cultures that gave birth to modern science as a systematic, self-correcting discipline. The historian is bound to ask why this should be so. That's the question. There were much more advanced cultures in Arabia and in China, a much higher level of learning, better technology. Why is it, though, that somewhere along the end of the Middle Ages in Europe, modern science was born? It has to do with the worldview that we as followers of Jesus, as Christians, bring to science. It's all about the worldview with which we begin. Science itself is actually not the problem. It's whatever presuppositions we may have when we approach it. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But first, there was something about this space and time along about the 1500s in Europe that allowed people to begin to go from alchemy to chemistry. Or from pure astrology to astronomy. And Rodney Stark, this sociologist who studied this group, looked at like the 52 most significant contributors to modern science at that time. And out of the 52, only two, a Swiss guy named Paracelsus and an English guy named Edmund Halley, which you might know from the comet fame, 
they were the only two people who were skeptical of faith. 50 of the most important contributors to science held faith as their worldview. The reason that this happened is because of some things that we just, we take as presuppositions with our faith. One is that God is an orderly, good God with rationality built into what you see. And if there's order, we can actually study and, and anticipate and replicate and learn. If it's just all chaos, then study doesn't matter because there's no rhyme or reason. There's no method to the madness. But we began with this idea of God of order. And then the created world actually, from the Christian perspective, is good. Now that sounds, duh, especially if you live in Southern California. Look at all the beauty around you. But for much of the world and for many worldviews, creation being good was not the starting point. It was evil, something to be escaped. In the Buddhist worldview, something to be transcended. You wanted to get out of it, not learn more and go deeper. And so this Christian worldview started to become not a science stopper, but a starter. Also, we believe we had rational minds that could grasp this. And then probably the most important one is the one that you and I can share today. It's the fact that the study of what God has created, or science, is actually possible a form of worship. That the more that you learn about what God has done, the more in awe you are of who he is. That the heavens declare the glory of God, and they have been since the beginning. It was Johann Kepler who gave us laws of planetary motion that said exactly this. He said, I had a desire to become a theologian, and then I discovered how much God is glorified in my astronomy. And he's glorified in your work, and if you're a scientist, God bless you, thank you for moving us forward and asking good questions and doubting your doubts and helping us to further find the revelation of God and his creation. But we have this problem because we're told that we can't get along. So why is that? Well, first, before I tell you the reason, let me tell you how it expresses itself most, at least to me as a pastor. It's usually one of the couple of questions. Somebody says, yeah, but, you know, the origin of the universe. It's all about the, how we began. And, and they, those two things, they just don't work together. Well, here's what's interesting. It was only about 100 years ago, 1927, that we began to experience the effects of somebody who said, I think the universe had a beginning. You know who it was? It was a Belgian Catholic priest, a guy named Father George Lamatra, who was also a cosmologist that put forth the Big Bang Theory first. The Big Bang Theory says that there was a moment when the universe began. Now that sounds like, of course, Except for millennia before that, people believed that the universe always existed. It was a steady state idea, that, that there was everything just always was here. And this man, using science and math, began to prove that, no, there was a moment when it all began to accelerate and everything happened. And you know what my Bible told me on page 1, Genesis 1-1? That in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It was formless and void. And how did it happen? He spoke. He said, let there be. Boom. And it was. And so science is now showing like, yep, he's been saying it all along. You don't have to choose between one or the other. But he goes further. Then in Genesis, it says not only did he create it all, and he goes through the order and, and how he created space and then filled the space with animals and plants and then, then us. As the crown of the creation. And he tells us in Genesis 1.28 to be fruitful and increase and fill the earth and subdue it, rule over it, care for it. In other words, treat it as I did, God would say. And so part of that is learning about it. Exploring what it was that he built into all this. How and why in the world did he make a platypus? Right? Right? And all of that could lead you to worship. It could lead you to say, no, I can't understand it. I can't make sense of that. I can't explain it. So, no. But that's what children do. Uh, that's also what the first children of God did. 
Adam and Eve, right? Sounds awfully familiar. I can't understand it. I'm not in control. Nah, get out of my seat. And yet, we have this opportunity to find and experience God through the origin of the universe. That's one of the questions. Another question that gets asked, and here's where, thankful for Scott Cody, because when somebody surprises you in your office, and clearly that was not set up, it is difficult to answer a question like, what about the dinosaurs in 60 seconds? So let me tell you about dinosaurs. You want me to solve the problem for you once and for all? Like, were there dinosaurs in the Bible? You want, you want to just, let me give you the answer. Well, I'm not, but I'm going to, uh, I do want to maybe pique your interest a little bit. Some of you may know this, but um, in Job, the oldest book that we have in the Bible, it's around 6,000 years old probably, um, that book, Job's got this problem, he's been through real difficulty, and God comes, and out of his grace, he begins to speak to Job to try to help him not to understand, but to trust what Brandon talked to you about us earlier. And in that trust, he describes all these things, like, can you understand this? Can you understand this? Can you control this? And one of the things he gets to in Job chapter 40 is this thing he calls the behemoth. Okay, so here's what I'm not saying to you. I am not staking my life and reputation or my firstborn on the fact that dinosaurs are in the Bible. But I want you to read this and tell me if it's at least not possible. You ready? He says, look at behemoth, which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins. What power in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar. That's a tree. Now, early on, people studying this thought, oh, because i got to make sense of it, right? Oh, he's talking about a hippo. Which, I mean, it's pretty good until you get to the part about the tail. Have any of you ever seen that feeble little thing that hippos drag behind them as a tail? Right? That is not like a cedar. Not the power, not the size. In fact, can you think of any land animal that has a tail that you would call like a cedar? I watched Jurassic Park, though, and there were some creatures in there that looked an awful lot like what he describes. He goes on to talk about how it's in the water, and, and in fact, the, uh, the raging river doesn't alarm it. It's so strong and sturdy, it can't be moved even when the river's at flood stage. And then, if you want to get really weird, the next chapter, he talks about this thing called Leviathan, which is like a sea creature that's strong with plates of armor and rows of teeth, and it sounds like Megalodon or Plesiosaurus or something. I don't know, but it doesn't sound like anything that I've caught. And all I want to say to you is, like, people have told you before that you can't believe in both. And I want to say it's really possible that right here, God left maybe for the glory of our discovery, some little moments to go, that could be it. I I don't know the answer, but I sure feel like I'm starting to grasp a God that is so full of abundance and creativity that anything's possible. The third question that usually gets asked, and it has to do with evolution, um, and, and that's one where I will say there are really intelligent, really faithful, really devout people who believe that the earth is 10,000 years old and mankind's been around for about six. And there are really good, really faithful, really devout, really intelligent people who believe that the earth has been around for four and a half billion years as part of a 13 billion year old universe. And I think if you've been told you got to choose between one or the other, I certainly believe that God created humans as he said, as something unique, given a soul, and there is a a difference that separates us from the rest of it. But if something like evolutionary creationism or theistic evolution, if that's actually true, that God punctuated moments of creation along the way, and we find that out, that just sounds like God to me. I, I, I don't think you have to choose. So what is the real issue? And, and this is where I'll kind of get to the end. Because it's not that difficult. It's, it's, it's kind of simple. The issue is a worldview that's lurking behind, not science, but something called naturalism. The real enemy, Alvin Plantica, who you should read if you like this stuff, uh, is, uh, according to him, is, is naturalism. And here's what a naturalist believes. 
It's a philosophical worldview that asserts that there's nothing else except what we can see, measure, and observe, only the natural order. There's nothing supernatural, there's nothing divine, there's nothing else out there. This is Carl Sagan, the blue dot guy, right? And he said one time, like, the universe is all there ever was, or ever is, or ever will be. That's it. And from a naturalist standpoint, remember I said it's a philosophical worldview, which means what? It's a trust, it's a faith position. You can't prove it. You start with this set of presuppositions. There is nothing else but what I see. So if anything challenges that, then I just write it off. And this is where the real issue is. The fight is between people who would say that it's only about what's observable. There is no God. There is no purpose. There is no plan. There is no designer. There is no outside force. It's just this random collection of chaos that in a multiverse of opportunities landed us with us. And then I go back to me standing on the beach and all of that stuff. And I in no means intend to say that anyone who believes differently than me is somehow less intelligent for sure. I just want you to doubt your doubt and to challenge that you're not basing it on science. You're basing it on a presupposition that you started with. And that's how we arrive at different endings. Does this make sense? I, I was reading through all this kind of stuff and like really, um, really went down a couple of rabbit holes of, of people who are naturalists. Have you, have you done this? You know, sometimes you get into the wrong Reddit forum and it's like, Come up later, you haven't eaten for days, you got Doritos on your shirt. And, and there was this one guy, he's a, a scientist, he's really, really, you can tell by his writing, he's incredibly intelligent. Uh, he lives in Hong Kong now, a young man. And, and I just, I read his words and it, it hurt. It was, it was sad and it was painful to me. And he is a self-proclaimed naturalist. And, and here's, I'll just give you a smattering of what he said. He, he said, this, these so-called theists believe in a God who answers prayers, who cares deeply for the well-being of all, who causes things to happen for the benefit of someone or something, performs miracles and other unbelievable random acts, establishes judgments. These theists have a close personal relationship with their God and believe adamantly in an afterlife. I view them, as a naturalist, as religious fanatics and their Bible, which I'll call holy fiction, that makes many claims about the natural world as bunk. This holy fiction states things like a great flood covering the earth, that the sun stood still one day, that Jesus was born of a virgin mother, and that the dead came back to life. There's no authority figure in natural science, so this can't be true. So I reject it on its face. That's the words of a person who's brilliant, but starts with a belief that it's impossible and can never get there. You don't have to be that person. You can actually experience the wonder and I would say the grace of scientific discovery as a way of worship to help you learn more about this God who is personal who does perform miracles, who does want to be with you, who wants to bring us to a life forever with him, and who ultimately defeated the greatest end of naturalism. Because after it's all said and done, a naturalist point of view says, you die, you're worm food, it's over. And yet, there's some pretty good evidence that a man named Jesus Christ of Nazareth went to a cross saying he was doing it to pay for your and my sin and was dead and buried and got up out of the grave. And just because I can't explain how that happened doesn't mean I have to reject that it's possible. So my call to you and to me is maybe for this year for us to to not just end with, I don't understand it, so I don't believe it. Or not, maybe not end with, I can't control it, so I won't participate. But maybe to allow ourselves to be caught up in the wonder of 45 miles of nerves and 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. And of a God who said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made with a purpose by me. What if we spent our time trying to get to know him? 
If you want to, I'm going to put a slide with some resources up for you that I used for this and others. Uh, you can take a quick screenshot or we'll post it later this week. But there's some incredible scientists and theologians still who are writing great stuff. Alvin Plantinga's work is fantastic on this. John Polkinghorne's Quirks, Quarks, Chaos and Christianity is really helpful. If you or someone in your life feels you're stuck in this. And of course, Alistair McGrath, as always. So I'd like to end like this. I want to end with a prayer that, that maybe we would get to um, experience this God who says he's close and available, knowable, and wants to invite us into this discovery. It's funny, the scriptures also tell us that, that if you want to know him, he's right there. Paul in Romans 120 said, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his power and nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that we're all without excuse. And that's my prayer for you, that you would know that God, his power, his divine nature, his love in deeper and deeper measures this year. So Father, as we turn our attention to um, the pursuit of life this year, we're going to all have opportunities to either say yes to kind of awakening to the wonder that is your creation. It'll happen in moments at the beach or with our grandkids. It'll happen in moments where we're just overwhelmed by a sense of, of that pale blue dot. How in the world... As seemingly small and insignificant as we are, do you love us? And how do you love us this much? God, I pray that you would take those who have serious doubt, who have a lifetime maybe of skepticism that's been built up, and you would show them and, and show all of us, in fact, because none of us are out of this boat, that there are places where we have asked for facts and not been able to trust faith, and that in the absence of that, we've thrown it out. It could be the unanswered prayer that we've been praying. It could be the disappointment or the hurt that we've experienced. And God, I just ask that you would continue to speak your eternal qualities, your divine nature, your power to us and through us this year. Would you help us to experience the pursuit of knowledge of what you've done as worship and to stay truly in awe of who you are. We pray Jesus in your name. Amen.